Welcome to Aerospace Structures 1. Today we'll be covering Lecture 7, the idea of spacecraft parts and fader modes. So here at the bottom right, you're going to see a paper that I think you should download and go through. On the left-hand side, I have another paper that I also think you should go and download. And we'll continue our coverage of the understanding of the fader modes in the various aerospace structures. We've already covered the fader modes in aircraft, launch vehicles, and now what I'm looking at is a better understanding of the fader modes in a spacecraft. What is the structure of a spacecraft? A structure of the spacecraft uh, has a primary structure, and the primary structure is made of a body structure and a launch vehicle adapter. The major load paths between the spacecraft components and launch vehicle are taken by this body here. Usually, primary structures are really designed for stiffness or natural frequency, because we don't want the natural frequencies of the spacecraft to start interacting in a damaging way with the launch vehicle. The launch vehicle vibration, vibration environments can be quite significant. And if these vibration environments are too significant, then you can start getting some amount of damage that can cause a spacecraft to fail. The, the structure also has to survive steady state accelerations, has to survive transient loading conditions during launch, and there are secondary structures. These secondary structures do not take the primary load path. Uh, the secondary structures are those attachments, like appendage, booms, support strusses, platforms, solar panels, and antenna dishes. Here you can see an example of a secondary structure. And here is a cartoon showing the solar panels. You have here an antenna and so forth. These, parts, these structures tend to be uh, sensitive to on-orbit thermal cycling, loads due to mission operations, acoustic pressure during launch, and, can, and which can be quite severe during launch condition. There's also tertiary structures, brackets, electronic boxes, and they tend to be smaller structures. Uh, they are high frequency, base dream vibration, uh, causes the most severe loading, and you also have fatigue and stiffness and positional stability, which tend to be the main driving requirements for these electronic boxes and brackets. So then here we have an interesting pattern from Lockheed Martin, and I, I invite all of you to download it because it shows a spacecraft a bus which has all the attachments and it has every single uh, piece numbered here in this patent. And so that'll give you a good understanding of how everything comes together. But you can see here major structural members. Uh, these are panels and then you have these panels that are acting like radial ribs which are attached to inner uh, panels as well. These panels provide the structural integrity and to that panel you have a lot of attachments. You have pressure vessels uh, that provide proportion abilities, you have antenna, you have uh, a number of electronic boxes, and uh, you have heating um, thermal management system that can be used to um, decrease the heating environments in the spacecraft as they can get heated from the sun or due to internal heat generation from the batteries and things like that. Here's an example of the spacecraft MSX, the Spirit 3 finite element. You can see here it has a separation plane and an ad adapter and an electronic section, solar arrays. It has a truss structure, an instrument section, and it has a beacon receiver. So this structure is going to have a lot of these components that are discussed here uh, in here. But what I'm showing here is a finite element model. And I'm showing that because I want to describe the finite element models are quite important. They're dynamic models that can help better understand the loads going into the spacecraft. This will be later discussed, but the bottom line is you have the main body of the structure, and then you have attachments that serve as the instrument, which then provide the ability of the spacecraft to perform. Here, I'm gonna show the structure of a spacecraft as shown here for the Apollo fuel cells. Uh, 
And here you have uh, panels, you have radio webs, you have uh, pressure vessels, uh, and so forth. This structure supports key components in desirable locations, and they consider thermal controls, fields of view for antennas and sensors, and the stored configuration must fit within the launch vehicle payload envelope, and the structure must protect the spacecraft components from dynamic environments during ground operations, during launch, deployment, and mission operations. Structural vibration, we don't want the structural vibrations to occur in a way where you could have interference with the launch vehicle control system. So that can be a problem as well. The spacecraft's vibration in its deployed configuration must not interfere with it, its own control system. Materials used must survive launch and on-orbit environments, and you could have time-varying applied forces, pressure, humidity, radiation, contamination, and thermal cycling. And here on the right-hand side, you can see a number of pressure vessels. You can see an oxygen tank, you can see a hydrogen tank, and you can see fuel cells as well, with the main body of the structure shown as a cylinder. And we trust this in the, in the interior, holding everything together. The spacecraft design is driven by the following factors. You have strength, which, amount, uh, which is the amount of the load a structure can carry without rupturing. You're going to have life, which are material fatigue and creep considerations. Creep can occur, say you have a mechanism, and the mechanism is stowed using a spring or some sort of device that bends. Well, in those considerations, you could get creep, and that could be a problem. Structural response can include magnitude and duration of vibration in response to external loads. You're also going to have natural frequency environments uh, that could uh, then interact with the launch vehicle. And th that could occur in the stored configuration. And then you also have to look at the on-orbit configuration. You also have the stiffness. And the stiffness needs to be allocated to the substructures to achieve the required natural frequency for larger assembly or to provide the necessary positional stability for a sense, sensor or antenna. And that needs to be done very carefully because you don't want to have the stiffness of the sensor or antenna to be interacting with the modes of the launch vehicle during ascent, as an example. And you also then have damping, which is the dissipation, dissipation of energy during vibration. If you have that kind of uh, energy dissipation uh, during vibration, that, that can be quite useful, but it could also be harmful depending upon what kind of damping you're utilizing. Spacecraft design is driven by the following factors. You're going to have the mass properties, uh, you have the mass, uh, mass moments, products of inertia, and center of mass, and that's, that's quite critical, and I'll show an example later on on how that can play a role. Uh, the mass properties um, need to be allocated carefully to the substructures as I discussed earlier. You also have the dynamic envelope, which could impose, you want to impose to avoid contact between two parts of the spacecraft on the loads. You also have the stability, uh, which is the ability to maintain location or orientation within a certain range. Mechanical interfaces, uh, locations of bolts, holes that define how structures and components attach. Design of mating structures to ensure that you have appropriate fits and that you don't have a vote, you know, you don't want to have excessive deformations uh, when loads are applied because that can be a qu quite a bit of a problem. The spacecraft system is a complex system. An example I'm showing here on the right hand side is a Terra spacecraft. The primary objective of the Terra mission is to simultaneously study the clouds, the water vapor, aerosol, trace gases land surface and oceanic properties, as well as the interaction between them and their effect on the Earth energy and budget climate. And this link, which I invite you to take a second and download, provides quite a bit of detail on this Terra spacecraft. And I think it would be very useful to gain a better understanding of that. We also want to look at uh, the number of instruments this spacecraft was performing. You have the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer, 
you have the clouds and earth radiant energy system you have the multi-angle imaging spectral radi radiometer uh, so as you can see there's a number of instruments being used in this particular Terra system and in here you can see antennas you can see um, a number of things going on in this a slide what we're seeing here is a primary structure and the primary structure in this case carries a primary vehicle loads as I discussed and that's for the terror system and most of the components are attached to these primary structures the buses and the tr trusses carry the primary vehicle loads the functions of the su structures subsystem are to enclose protect and support the other spacecraft subsystems and to provide a mechanical interface with the launch vehicle. Structural members provide the mating and attachment points for subsystem components, such as batteries, propellant tanks, and electron electronic modules. The structure must also sustain the stresses and loads experienced during environmental testing, launch, perigee, and apogee firings, and deployment of booms, solar arrays, and antennas. Noises, high G forces, and vibrations can especially severe can, can be quite severe on the spacecraft during launch. And so you can see a number of events that could be quite uh, significant for primary structures. You also have acoustic noise, uh, which is really high at the early stages of the launch and is transmitted from the rocket motors by the air through the fairing or housing into the spacecraft. And you'll see later on that acoustic testing is done to really target this particular stage of launch which quite be, could, could be quite significant and, and should be considered. Steady loads are transmitted through the structure as the rocket accelerates the spacecraft to the velocities required for injection, injection into orbit. There's a wide range of uh, vibration frequencies that are transmitted through the spacecraft supports from the rocket motors. Pyrotechnic devices and springs send sudden shocks through the structure as the spacecraft separates from the booster and the various components are deployed into their operational configurations. When the spacecraft reaches its final orbital position, the loads on the spacecraft are greatly reduced in a zero gravity environment. But the alignment requirements of sensitive instruments can be very rigorous. In addition, there are many environmental protection factors that exist in space that must be considered. And so we, we definitely want to make sure that the sensitive environments are not going to get damaged by the harsh conditions in space. Remember that spacecraft is going to see very cold conditions and very hot conditions when it's exposed to the radiation environments from the sun or the radiative. Inside the body of the spacecraft is a honeycomb structure where the equipment boxes are attached. In a body mounted structure, Equipment is attached directly to the structural elements. You also have inflatable structures, or, and these tend to be the latest trend in spacecraft structures. You have low mass and low volume during launch, but following depo deployment, they can expand to volumes not achievable in rigid structures. Other primary structures um, that are considered uh, are usually made of honeycomb sandwich panels because they tend to provide high stiffness, bending stiffness, and they also provide um, low weight. Thrust cones and thrust cylinders uh, tend to take the axial and shear bending loads. It resists the buckling failure modes, and it needs to be designed in a way that it can survive the ascent environments. These thrust cones and thrust cylinders tend to be monocoque or semi-monocoque, and they can also use longitudinal stiffeners or, uh, in the sandwich constructions, or it could be sandwich construction itself. You also have struts and longerons uh, that take the axial compression or tension loads and can help resist buckling or tensile loads. And this was discussed in the context of aircraft, but sca spacecraft also have something very similar. You also have panels and bulkheads and rings. Brackets and clips are also used. And you also have other types of components like aft bulkhead, equipment bulkhead supports, payload equipment, antenna platform, main shear panels, diagonal shear panels, 
axis panels, longerons, and solar array substrates. The spacecraft components here, I'm showing here for the MSX launch configuration. I'm showing the truss system. I'm showing the Spirit 3 interface right here and the instrument section interface joint. This upper diagonal section is of quite importance. Uh, you have a column and then you have the electronic section uh, joint interface. You can see here almost like a gazette. And these gusset um, joints uh, are able to then bring these trusses in and connect them. The thing I want to make sure you understand is that uh, these connections can take quite a bit of loading conditions and they need to be designed appropriately with uh, the appropriate bolt sizing. Here on the right hand side I show the an interface fitting. Uh, all components are graphite epoxy in this case and you'll see that in the paper if you go deeper into it. You have the lower diagonal I-beam so you can see the reason I'm showing this is to show you that in spacecraft components we use similar features as what you will see in civil engineering where I-beams are used, you're using gusset panels and backing plates uh, to provide the resistance uh, to failure due to the loading environments the spacecraft will experience. Uh, down here I'm showing you a upper diagonal interface fitting. All components are graphite epoxy. Uh, at the top you have the instrument interface end cap and then you have the upper diagonal I-beam and a doubler plate and these components come together into that connection. Spacecraft components, uh, you're going to have a number of equipment modules and these equipment modules uh, is going to consist of a number of electronic components as well. And the, the concerns here tend to be thermal cycle fatigue, vibration environments that could cause these structures to dramatically fail due to the vibration environments. Here are other spacecraft components. You have power equipment module batteries. And these batteries can be quite sensitive because these batteries can explode. The nickel metal hydrate or nickel hydrogen is the main type of battery being used to store energy on the ISS right now, the International Space Station. But as lithium ion batteries started to take over on the surface of the Earth, NASA and other aerospace companies have started to incorporate them into the vehicle as well. You also have solar panels, and these solar panels can be quite sensitive to um, micro orbit debris. You can have impact damage onto these panels. You can have thermal cycle fatigue from the fuel cells coming off the backing, um, the backbone of the structure. And you could also have the e situation where the deployment mechanisms are not properly occurring. They're not working properly. And solar panels really require these mechanisms to work really well because if not, you're not going to get the solar energy needed to operate um, properly the spacecraft. The spacecraft is going to contain a number of mechanisms, a pin puller, a forward active latch, you're going to have a solar array drive, a pin puller, uh, you can see that there in this drawing, and you're going to have a boom and a passive latch in the inboard panel. And th this is basically a top view. And this basically is a drive adapter that basically drives a solar array. And this right here is called a solar array drive. And then you're going to have the active latch pin and the boom deployment mechanism right here. And then these are the hinges uh, and the panel rotational actuator. Here's an example of 115 foot solar array, which extends from the International Space Station as it orbits 220 miles above the Earth. This photo shows a portion of the 32,800 solar cells that produce 32 kilowatts of electricity, enough to power 16 homes. On the Space Shuttle latest mission to the station, the Atlantis crew delivered the port three and four integrated truss segment a 35,000 pound structural support system. The port four included solar cell arrays and is similar to the one pictured here. And as well, it had the battery, the power conditioning system, and all of that was developed under the management of the NASA Glenn Research Center.
After being deployed on flight day six, the solar arrays will then span over 240 feet. You can see that I need a number of mechanisms for this to operate properly. Spacecraft components and integration. You, here you have the component communication equipment module, the power equipment module, and the primary structure supporting these uh, modules on it. Now, what I want to make sure is when I have the vibration environments, that I don't break the connections to the spacecraft or that these uh, equipment modules, which have mass, uh, become another loading conditions to the body of the structure that will make it fail. The spacecraft components thermal control. Uh, you need to have a thermal control system to manage the loading conditions, um, the thermal conditions, because things are going to get hot, cold, and I need to make sure, we need to make sure that things are getting relatively uh, benign from that perspective. Satellites operate in a very hostile environment and malfunctions cannot be repaired. That's the issue here and that's what makes this so complicated. Major environmental problems that satellite designers must address is thermal conditions. Regulating this thermal environment is key because many electronics must be kept within a modest temperature range to operate reliability. There might be a sharp thermal gradient which occurs when a satellite moves from an eclipse condition to a full solar illumination and you're going to see a quick shift in temperatures and that thermal gradient can be quite damaging to the spacecraft. And here you have an example of heat coming in and heat coming out. Uh, with a vapor core, and that what does, it helps manage the system quite a bit. You also have the evaporator and the condenser. Spacecraft components. Here you have a thermal control system. The special conditions do exist where a remote sensing instrument has to be kept really cold to obtain precise information. Otherwise, things can go haywire. Also, Outer space is cold, but an object can get quite hot due to the sun. So the structure has to be designed so that it absorbs some degree of the heat, but it can also reflect some of the heat back so that the spacecraft remains neither not too hot, not too cold. You can see the complication here, and it's not very simple. The power system of satellite generates electricity and heat. The interior heat of a sa satellite can build up over time unless there's a mechanism to transfer the heat inside the spacecraft to the outer shell. Efficient methods exist where you can use a heat pipe, and a heat pipe operates uh, either passive, passive or active. And if you have passive, it's not moving parts. One of the main advantages of this system is high reliability operation without consuming a great deal of mass budget for the satellite with a minimum demand on the volume that these devices consume. In this example, I'm showing GNC, and you're gonna have star trackers and reaction wheel assembly. And these um, assemblies become quite important as will be discussed later. The gyro is spin stabilized, which means the entire gyro um, platform is spun by an Electronic, electric motor to exactly counteract the spin of the rocket. Spin stabilization is needed in mechanical gyros when the body is rotating at a really high rate. And you can see here the spin rotation of the large gear mounted to the base of the gyro frame and then the drive motor with gear at the top and the spin of the gyro platform is to the left. And so not only can a gyro be used to sense the orientation of the vehicle, it can also be used to control the flight path. If winds or other external forces cause the vehicle to deviate from its nominal flight path, you're gonna have an unanticipated error signals will be generated and the flight computer will try to null them out and bring the vehicle back to where it should be. To do this, the gyro needs to be connected to a flight computer. The flight computer has the desired flight profile program into it. As the attitude of the rocket needs to change, the program feeds error signals into the control algorithm and the system tries to null out the errors. The errors are nulled out when the attitude of the vehicle moves to the desired orientation. The orientation can be changed using movable fins 
or aerodynamic control surfaces, gimbal control nozzles or thrusters. The orientation on the spacecraft, you need to orient that spacecraft. And it, that can be mechanical, mechanically altered using gyro without the need of th thrusters. And that's very advantageous. To do this, you're going to have a heavy flywheel rotor uh, and it's connected to the motorized gimbals. When the spacecraft needs to be reoriented, then the motorized gimbals attempt to reorient the flywheel. Since the spinning flywheel has the rot rotational inertia, it tries to resist the force being applied by the motorized gimbal. When this happens, Newton says an equal and opposite reaction will occur. As such, the motorized gimbal also pushes against the frame of the spacecraft. And since the spacecraft is free to rotate, its attitude will change. And so this really works really well. And the control moment gyro is not the same gyro that's used to sense the orientation of the spacecraft. These control moment gyros can be used in a number of ways. And so in GNC, there is a number of the development of three axis body stabilized platforms that have been used to for the deployment of more capable and much higher gain communications antenna. High resolution remote sensing and meteorological sensors and more precise navigational payloads. The most important development in spacecraft buses has been the development of precisely oriented body stabilized platform that allow the deployment of a very high powered solar array and very accurate pointing of high gain antennas. There's been a number of challenges uh, that have included developing lower mass and structurally strong spacecraft bodies, improving and longer life thrusters. You also have the better performance power systems with greater density of charge and improved thermal control systems. So in here, we're going to explore the development of spacecraft bus and their technologies. The point and accuracy of a satellite not only depends on the speed and performance of the momentum or reaction wheel, but also the ability of the spacecraft to be oriented exactly the way you need it at the desired time and direction. The very high torque of the reaction of moment wheel allows very small adjustments to that, and by adding or subtracting a small amount of energy to reaction wheel on single axis stabilized systems can be achieved. Once this is done in all three axes, the satellite can be perfectly stabilized and pointed in the, direct, in the correct orientation and direction. A moment wheel rotates at a higher speed than a reaction wheel up to 10,000 RPM to provide the required stability. Momentum wheels are quite small in diameter, um, but they're very high, they have very high rotational speed of 4,000 to 5,000 RPM and give them a great deal of inertial force or torque. Spacecraft components here, I'm showing you the reaction wheels, uh, four reaction wheel assembly mounted, three of the each torque rod assemblies mounted on the inside of this surface of the two axis and the y axis honeycomb panels, and you can see them here in, in, in these examples. Um, in one each reaction wheel control uh, electronics package mounted on the side of the two axis honeycomb panels. You're also going to have reaction wheel assemblies. And the key features tend to be uh, a, it applies a reaction torque for the three axis added to control, um, a bidirectional angular momentum storage, and can operate in excess of 1,000 RPM. And these reaction wheel assemblies. Uh, consists of drive electronics, bush, brushless motors, bearings, and an inertia rotor. You can see the inertia rotor here, um, the motor and communications, the bearings, the housing cover, and a number of other components. On the right-hand side, I'm showing you the uh, other components of the MX spacecraft, which earlier I showed you a finite element model, but it's worth looking at. You know, here you have the honeycomb panel, you have the payload adapter here, and then electronic section in this section here. The truss section, the instrument section, and then you have the beacon receiver uh, bench, the Spirit 3 instrument, and so forth. Metallic pressure vessels, like COPVs, you have failure modes, and, and those are the same as I had discussed earlier.
when I cover the launch vehicle designs. Here is a spacecraft component integration, which is quite important. This spacecraft needs to be attached to the, to the payload adapter. And uh, here the Terra has a weight of 5190 kilograms, at quite a big, big diameter here with a length of 6.8 meters. It's a fairly large system. And here you can see the fairing encapsulating the adapter. Uh, this fairing here is going to protect the environments the spacecraft is going to see during ascent. Uh, it's going to protect it from acoustic environments and contamination, which, which tends to be quite, quite critical. I have a number of design guidelines that I would like to talk about. Uh, mechanisms, uh, any device that's required to move, rotate, slide, or separate. It's characterized by displacements, which are could be small displacements of structures. And often a mechanism functions as a structural member prior to, during, or after deployment. Design guidelines. So we need to build in redundancy. We want to provide a high force torque margin. Designed to preclude improper assembly or installation. We also want to allow for visual inspection. That's very critical. Uh, there's also a number of thermal considerations that need to be looked at, um, like materials, clearance, preload, vacuum considerations. We're concerned very often of outgassing of the materials and cold welding, heat dissipation, lube. And there's also a number of vibration considerations like potting, positive locking, preload change and wear. Now, cycle life uh, can also include ground testing. And, it, you know, you want to design for ease of analysis and also ease of testing. That's very crucial. Here are a number of mechanism parts, and I'll be discussing this later in detail to try to describe to you the kinds of failure modes that we could be looking at. You have bearings, lubrication, force torque. And force torque, we're looking here at torsion spring, constant force spring, and then you have lenticular tape. Lenticular tapes can be quite complex. They can buckle and they can get stuck. There's a number of issues there. You also have release devices, power and signal tra transfer, and telemetry devices, exchange devices as well. And um, these mechanisms have to operate properly. There's a number of structures that have to operate, but the mechanisms have to operate really well. Sorry about that. Mechanisms uh, include electronic, electrical and fluid disconnects during jettison. You can see that. Spacecraft and sub-satellite separation. Ion thruster gimbals after achieving orbit. Doors and covers that open or close. Solar array boom and antenna deployments. Solar array sun tracking is quite important. Pointing antennas and instruments is, is of extreme importance. You can have active doors and shields, uh, gyroscopes and reaction wheels, bearings, pyrotechnics like cables and bolt cutters and pin putters and pin pushers, uh, motor driven latches, very important. And then we have MMODs. Uh, this is uh, of extreme importance. MMODs can be quite severe. Uh, Micrometeorite and man-made debris orbit the Earth and are major threats to the spacecraft. That's why I'm emphasizing this here quite a bit because I want you to learn about this. It, it can be a, quite a bit of a problem. You have orbital, orbital debris consisting of remnants from previous missions. Then you have the items that collide and explode, uh, creating pieces of debris uh, that range from the size of a school bus down to the size of a grain of sand. Orbital debris is the number one threat to spacecraft, and astronauts even. Collisions of this debris can put damage to the spacecraft, and you can have an issue there where you, ha you can have pressure loss and the astronauts could be in trouble. Just imagine a one centimeter pain fleck at 22,000 meters per second, uh, miles per second, miles per hour, I'm sorry, can cause the same damage as a 550 pound object traveling 60 miles an hour. And that's because of one half mb squared. You can have something very small mass 
with very high velocity and that can cause a very large amount of damage when you compare to a, a pain fleck. The International Space Station um, is designed and is designed to meet some requirements of uh, the probability that the debris could impact and cause critical failure and that must be less than half percent per year due to the human inhabitants. You also can see here that there is a amount of a uh, significant amount of uh, on-orbit debris. Geostationary and communication spacecraft. Uh, in the geostationary orbit, um, due to the low perceived hazard in geostationary orbit, no spacecraft in GEO are known to have design requirements specifically for protection against debris impacts, though they are designed to survive the micrometeorite environment. The rather sad spacecraft is designed to be launched into the orbital regime with a high debris flux, and so a lot of things had to be done back then. You can see here that debris is increasing from uh, 1, 2000 to 2010, and those are cataloged and kept in track. Anything greater than 10 centimeters, they're looking for to make sure well, we're protecting the satellite. And there's something large coming up. You can always maneuver the spacecraft and avoid it. And that's a lot of work. That's not a simple activity. Over here, what I'm showing is the ISS radiator damage and solar array damage. On the left side, you can see punctures into um, the radiator damage. On the right hand side, you can see solar array damage. High confidence is required in the assessment of the response of spacecraft components and shield configurations to debris impact. On the right hand side, you can see significant amount of damage due to um, these events. Component and shield co qualification and acceptances can be conducted by hypervelocity impact testing. And a lot of people do testing um, looking at a full range of debris impactor sizes, composition, shapes, and velocities. Spacecraft com protection systems currently are designed to resist the type of projectiles that can be launched by these facilities. Most typically will be aluminum spheres. Uh, the debris objects are complex shapes, likely to do more damage than spheres at LEO velocities. So surfaces may not be adequately protected. And you can see here the damage. And analytical models can be used to design spacecraft shielding and to pre predict. You can then shield the spacecraft from problems. And we can model the characteristics of break of debris. Uh, and we want a model that will require validation against experimental data. That's not easy to do because of the high velocities we're talking about, but that is done. So there are damage protection techniques that are used in the comprise of a passive, active, or operational protection schemes that can be used to protect spacecraft from debris impact damage. Passive protection generally will consist of shielding a spacecraft of its critical components. You have active protection schemes, use sensors to provide an advanced warning of the impact, and these active protection schemes can then help uh, remove the spacecraft to avoid that poten potential damage. There is operational protection schemes change the design of a spacecraft to allow for graceful degradation or change a spacecraft operation to reduce the overall hazard to the mission. Designers can trade off costs and then benefit can be seen for each method. Passive protection exists. Uh, it involves the shielding of a spacecraft against debris impact. Spacecraft are much more likely to be struck by small debris than by medium-sized debris. And how much shielding is required depends on the acceptable level of risk that you're trading with the added mass required to protect the spacecraft against the various debris sizes that you have. For example, component walls can be thickened or layers of particle breaking material can be added. But you know, just know that if you do that, um, you may have to then figure out how to go about the mass. Um, you may have to add layers that protect the thermal blankets uh, and they'll cover the exterior of a spacecraft. 
if designed uh, properly, um, you can then add, um, you know, you can add shields and that could drive uh, the minimization of mass, size, and cost, uh, while also maximizing the protection against debris damage. So these shields can be very useful. Two types of basic shields are typically seen is monolithic, monolithic shields, which are simple, low volume, and a Whipple bumper shields, which generally provide far better protection against high velocity orbital debris than the same mass of a monolithic shielding. Monolithic shielding are used to protect against small mass and lower velocity impacts. Uh, you have the pro pro projectile's impact energy, which is low and typically does not break up, and the shield is affected because in this case the mass is sufficient to absorb and distribute the impact energy. At higher collision velocities, however, impacting objects often break apart on impact. And at typical LEO collision velocities, an impacting object will generally melt or vaporize. You're going to have fragmented or melted impactors, which will either cause a large spherical crater or perforate the shield, depending on the shield thickness. While monolithic shields can protect against high velocity impacts, the monolithic shield thickness required to prevent perforation increases with approximately two-thirds power of the collision velocity. Here, everything, anything you see in colors is a shield, and you can see it's shielding a lot of parts in this ISS. You also have uh, active protection uh, to use sensors to warn the impending debris impact. And then you can move the spacecraft away from potential impact. And you could use ground-based sensors to alert the crew, fire maneuvering rockets to safely avoid objects, and all active protection mechanisms require advanced detection and warning. Because debris may approach a spacecraft high velocities than 10 kilometers, kilometers per second in LEO, most require warning when a potential impactor is hundreds of kilometers away from the spacecraft to allow the spacecraft time to respond. You then have safely maneuver, rotate within operation, operating limits, fire at the impactor. The necessary detection and tracking capabilities to provide this warning is supplied by either you have onboard sensors sometimes or you have ground-based spacecraft surveillance, surveillance system, I'm sorry. Operationally, we're talking about using a more oversized design, so you're using a lot of redundancy, so if you have an impact damage, it doesn't affect the spacecraft. A secondary advantage of operational techniques is that they not only protect against the debris hazard, but also protect the spacecraft against failures unrelated to the debris impact. Oversizing can be used also for solar panels and other components to allow a given amount of degradation while also retaining the required performance levels. Another operational protection technique is redundancy, which is used primarily for electronic and proportion components. You can duplicate components in two or more places on the spacecraft so that if one component fails, another can take the place. So redundancy can be very helpful but adds mass and so you have to balance the two. GPS utilizes this approach by maintaining more spacecraft in orbit than needed at any one time. The example here is the radar sat is a 3,000 kilogram spacecraft. And in this case, you have a three-axis stabilized spacecraft with, a, uh, with about five square meters of frontal surface, which is designed functionally uh, for five years. Uh, the orbital regime where it's at is high debris. So an assessment was required of this debris hazard. Designers predicted that approximately flux of space debris on the spacecraft, given this rather sad orbit parameters and configuration, they needed to do something about that. And so they estimated number of impacts that could occur on the leading phase of the spacecraft, which is a phase that's closest to the debris of impact, with respect to debris size and expected velocity relative to the debris side. 
Analysis is then indicated at one millimeter particle and a large number of smaller objects uh, will then impact the spacecraft leading surface during its five year mission with velocities that could be quite large. It looked at 15 kilometers per second uh, with impacts angles that could go from 15 to 30, five to 30 even. And so a lot of testing can be done to really understand how the materials behave to the types of impacts you could have. Spacecraft components were analyzed then in this case to determine the vulnerability to impacts, but you don't want to rely on analysis alone. You want to have some validation against test data. The payload module contained electronic components uh, that were behind a honeycomb shear panel. So the analysis of the module was really focused on whether the shear panels could shield electronics. Hypervelocity impact equations can be used um, here, and uh, it can show that whether you can have uh, adequate shielding. On the bus module, which is a sensitive equipment, uh, and it was mounted in the outside of the honeycomb shear panel, and was only protected by MLI, which is a multi-layer insulation thermal blanket for thermal protection, separated from the shear panels by 15 to 25 centimeters. So the analysis had to be done. They need to figure out whether uh, each component could survive the debris environment, uh, but also um, ensure that you know, testing was done at the NASA hyper, Hypervelocity Impact Facility to confirm the results that, that were found. They're able to increase the survivability, survivability uh, from 50% to 90% over five years by molding, making changes to the design. And, you know, unfortunately, that increased the weight, um, 17 kilograms. Uh, so a layer, in this case, a layer of Nextel was added to the MLA blankets of the bus module, a bus module uh, components that were considered more vulnerable, vulnerable had their walls thickened. And so a gap between the bus module and the payload module was closed to protect a number of hydrazine lines. Shields were also added to some hydrazine lines to decrease the probability of the direct hits Forward cor corner post uh, radiators of the bus were also thickened, and they had to do that to shield other electronic components. Let's now discuss mechanisms. I invite you to download NASA Standard 5017, uh, which provides design and development requirements for mechanisms. I will not be covering those requirements here, but I'd like you to peruse through, glance over, and understand the kinds of requirements that exist for mechanisms for space applications. Based upon a detailed study of the performance records of almost 400 satellites between 1958 and 1983, it was established that about 10% of successfully launched satellites had some sort of deployment anomaly. And the majority of them were mechanisms. And that's where I want to focus my attention. Uh, normally we talk about structures, but what I want to point out here is a mechanism is a structure. It's, just a, mo it's a moving structure, right? And so I, I, want, I want you guys to really get a really good understanding of the type of failure modes that could occur in mechanisms. There's three major categories of mechanisms. You have the deployable appendages. Uh, you have uh, rotating systems and oscillating systems. Deployable appendages can include solar arrays, uh, retention and release mechanisms, bearings, lubrication, and tri tribology considerations, antennas and masts, actuators, uh, transport mechanisms, and switches. And then you also have the general and miscellaneous. Rotating systems include momentum wheels, uh, reaction wheels, control momentum gyroscopes, gears, motors, bearings and lubrication, and slip rings and roll rings. So you have a number of deployable appendages, you have rotating systems, and any of these things can go wrong due to maybe FOD, or you have a creep situation, you have high cycle fatigue or low cycle fatigue, you have the thermal cycle fatigue issues. So th things like that can be a significant problem. And so uh, let's look at Middleham Book 83577B, which sets 
Fourth, general requirements for the design, manufacture, quality control, and testing of moving mechanical assemblies to be used in space launch vehicles. So I think it's worth taking a look at that in the NASA 5017 standard. Many of the requirements listed are based, you know, they really came up with a list of anomalies and then they developed requirements to address those anomalies. So those don't happen again. And that's how requirements are really built, right? You're looking at the past history, trying to develop an understanding of the anomalies and then you basically want to close the loop and make sure you have a robust system. Deployables shall be designed so that they are self-supporting when placed in an orientation relative to gravity while either in a stored or deployed configuration. You also want deployables to, be, to have sufficient force to permit full operation during ground testing without depending upon the assistance of gravity to, to demonstrate deployment. For retention and release devices, you're looking at positive retention provisions, which then provide, you know, are provided for deployables in the stowed and in the deployed configurations. The effects of deflection, such as those induced by centrifugal forces or differential thermal growth of any deployable with respect to space vehicle attachments, need to be considered in the design of the attachment. You also have devices that could be subject to binding and that can happen due to misalignment, adverse tolerances or contaminations. Um, you know, you want to be careful that those devices are not, you know, be affected by binding. You also have slip joints that need to be considered and should be avoided uh, altogether. Pin pullers, uh, anytime you have a pin puller being used um, and you could have a cartridge that's actuated Actually, in the pin puller, you can have a non-explosive pin puller. They need to be designed for double shear. The design, installation, and checkout procedures for pin pullers, uh, we need to ensure that loads due to misalignments of the pin are within design limits. You also need a minimum retraction force margin of safety of 100% at the worst case environmental condition under the worst case tolerances. And that needs to be maintained for any non-explosive uh, pin puller of high importance. Many of the requirements listed are based on anomalies in spacecraft. You have bearings and for example you have uh, deployables, hinges, linkages, self-aligning bearings. They need to preclude binding due to misalignments. Dry, and you, you know I can keep going on in that subject, that's why I put the three dots, but you have dry lip film lubrication. Application of dry film lubricants to the surface of the bearings, V-band clamps, coil springs, leaf springs, clock springs, and constant force springs, gears, and other items, we need to make sure that they follow an appropriate process. Because, you know, we don't want to have, um, you want to make sure the bonding, peening, sputtering, vacuum de deposition, ion plating, or any other process that provides predictable, uniform, and repeatable lubricant film that does be appropriate. Corrosion-resistant materials uh, need to be used for the bearings uh, that employ a dry film lubricant. And you also want to do testing at moisture environments to make sure that uh, we don't have an issue there. We also have hard coatings. Um, and the hard coatings such as titanium carbide, titanium nitride, and chromium may be used to extend life, reduce wear, and prevent welding, reduce friction, and prevent corrosion either with or without liquid dry film lubricant. A 10-year review of the major test observations are given, and I'm going to go through a number of anomalies now, and what I want you to do is understand why these anomalies occurred, and what steps may have been taken to remedy the situation. You know, thermal vacuum testing has proved to be essential in providing a detailed assessment of the reliability of complex mechanisms by subjecting them to realistic simulations of the anticipated flight conditions, where you can have lifetimes that go up to 10 years. Thermal vacuum tests have been proven and they've been used quite a bit as a cost-effective way in avoiding delays in disturbances to a number of European projects and, and America as well. And they are able to then uh, expose failure modes by performing this test. 
This and this thermal vacuum test becomes very important and it's used quite a bit. The solar maximum mission satellite was launched into orbit with experiments to monitor solar activity. To obtain common object observations, experiments must be co-aligned with 90 seconds of the spacecraft pointing vector. So we want to use kinematic principles and good design practices <coughs> to produce a stable support platform that is isolated mechanically and thermally from a supporting structure and from experiments mounted on it. So using a reference surface, uh, you're going to have gauges and optical measuring uh, technique, and it, it is possible to co-align experiments to a high degree of accuracy. So, you know, it is important to co-align uh, the spacecraft pointing vector. Almost every deployment mechanism related to a spacecraft on orbit configuration um, can be quite important and it's a single point failure if it does not function proper, functionally proper. Function property, I'm sorry. All deployed appendage programs must have engineering test units. We want to make sure of that. All flights and engineering units must be testable to determine deployment margins. We also want to make sure that analysis is used in a judicious manner and there, we are verifying the hardware testing program. That's very important. There must be an adequate life testing early in the program. You also want to have, because you don't want to test too late in the game. You know, if you test too late in the game, uh, you could run into trouble later when everything is integrated at a higher level. And then delays could occur. There has to be redundant backup systems in all critical areas. Worst case analysis in failure mode effects and critical analysis has to be performed and verified by actual hardware testing. Conditions that must be considered in this uh, type of work is to include the worst case friction, misalignment, and excessive preload. All devices should be designed to be as simple as possible to do an adequate job. And so we're looking for all possible hostile environmental effects and designed to minimize their impact. We need to pay attention to vacuum, thermal control, and G effects that are not always intuitive to the designer. So we ought to select devices that are directly testable and reusable to be qualified by analysis rather than single-use devices that are statically qualified to a pass-fail criterion. Proper installation should be also verifiable. We need to make sure that we have the knowledge of preloads, position of parts, status of uh, switches, or other electrical interfaces that should be known or testable. Solar array. So th there is a cosmic background explorer. You know, one of the damper requires required replacement because of the air bubble. A pin puller shaft had to be, you know, was fractured and rebounded in an unfired position. So they had to do something about that, and they had to come up with uh, root cause and uh, ways to address this. And so excessive hole drilling in this puller was the one that caused the failure, and if they had done a pin puller uh, x-ray, they would have found this issue. The Earth radiation budget satellite um, experienced excessive bearing friction and is experienced... Uh, you know, poor characteristics of lubricant at cold conditions. And you see this theme a lot where uh, cold conditions can, with, with lubricant, can be a problem. Moisture led to frozen balls in the path of the rolling elements, and then that caused uh, impeding movement of the drive torque. It prevented the solar array from initially deploying. So you have insufficient torque margin, and these are likely to result in deployment problems. <clears throat> Lessons learned from the Mildstar flexible substrate solar array. You had to conduct analyses and tests to ensure adequate preload. Testing should include acoustic and shock testing, and we also want to make sure we have coatings for the coefficient of friction and making sure uh, that we understand that they can depend on humidity is usually forgotten. 
high cleaning list standard during cell bonding is required because otherwise you have debonding. And then during thermal cycling, uh, the situation can be that you have fatigue crack growth due to the temperature swings from hot to cold and cold to hot. We don't want to rely on the preload and friction during ascent. We want to use a positive mechanical device such as a pin. Retention and, and release mechanisms. Uh, you have the quick release pins, which are used on many space mechanisms. Most often is used when an astronaut will have direct interface with the mechanism. It provides the ability to provide quick release of the interfacing parts. To prevent locking balls from vibrating out of their socket, four balls are installed of two instead of two, and, and this should be installed to provide redundancy if one ball fails out of the socket. You should also look at lubricants, and I keep pointing this because it, it is one of the issues that come up quite often. Liquid lubricants can freeze, and that's the issue, and can, can cause the pins to, to cease moving. So dry film lubricants should be used to lubricate all internal parts of a pin pin, pip pin, uh, which is a quick release pip, uh, pin. Problems experienced with pyrotechnic pin pullers, that will include blow-by across O-ring seals caused by wearing of the coating on the pin that is deposited on the O-ring. And for pyrotechnic devices, we need to carry tests to ensure that a device has an acceptable functional margin. A lot of acceptance testing, at least one pin puller, so you want to do a lot of acceptance tests, uh, exposed to 125% explosive power in a cold environment. If the spacecraft requires a high level of, of clean, mean less, then multiple paratonic seals have to be used to prevent gas leakage. Very important. Here I have a list of anomalies, and it's very useful to see what is going on. From 1976 to 1986, here is a link where I got the majority of these materials. We also have, uh, in 1976, we had the firing which, um, of, of the pin assembly. Uh, that corroded and uh, locked in qualification. Uh, there was a source of uh, failure was bad design. The resolution there was uh, a redesign of um, and requalification. In 1973, we saw the pin puller fail during a, a system test, uh, the cartridge closure blocking board, and that was due to a lack of understanding. It was, it was also redesigned and requalified. 1979, uh, the pin puller ruptured during a system test, and there's an inadequate uh, containment margin and variation in the metal grain orientation. So, grain orientation can be a significant issue. There's also a lack of un understanding, and the resolution was to properly redesign and requalify the system. In t 1987, we had the pin puller uh, which failed. Um, stroke against flight and uh, you had a side load there and the NSI output restrict was restricted causing reduced output and housing deformation against the working piston so a bad design means application of hardware here um, so they had to go ahead and replace and requalify that was the bottom line their pin puller failed to function in that um, and lot acceptance test, that's what that means. And NSI produced insufficient pressure uh, caused by coatings of pressurized volumes. So again, misapplication of hardware, lack of understanding, and then changing the manufacturer and the design as well. 1986, you have the bolt cutter failed uh, from a lot acceptance testing, uh, and there was improper compression margin test requirement. So that shows that you could have an incorrect specification and the resolution is the correct, you know, correct that specification. Power technique failures, uh, you know, many power technique failures are single shot devices. 35 out of 84 of the failures were caused by a lack of understanding. 24 were mistakes made by poor designs and misapplication of hardware. And 23 failures are due to manufacturers poor procedures and quality control. Structural latches are used in modular assembly or spacecraft and space mechanisms for rotor screws 
latches, uh, you have thread engagement, um, which is improved by providing leaves in. Rolling element latches interfaces uh, reduce particle generation. And then you have Teflon wiper, which shields, controls loose particles in the rotor screw structural latch. At launch, the near infrared mapping spectrometer of the Galileo spacecraft had two covers in place to protect the instrument from contamination. Two and a half months after launch, there's an initial attempt to eject the covers, but that was unsuccessful. So they have to figure out, you know, what could be going wrong. And so a lot of testing and analysis had to be put in place. And so they found that covers should be tested in the flight environment. That's a lesson learned. And the consequences of flight um, uh, rule changes should be evaluated carefully because you, if you're stuck with this situation, that could be a significant problem. During one of the solar array deployment tests in 1989, a pin puller in a release mechanism was actuated. And so the pin was retracted, retracted inside its housing to release the solar array, but then it rebounded back of its housing. So it didn't stay retracted like it should. And so the normal function of the pin puller is to stay back, but then um, the pin puller, you know, it didn't work properly. And so the recommendation there is that you want to have an inertia load of the deployment system and ensure that it's low and that you should have a more ductile material, to set, you know, and that be selected over brittle material for the actuator housing and, this, and the piston. And then you should conserve, uh, consider a pin puller load acceptance test. Uh, because at least one test should include the subject pin puller to zero inertia loads in the shear direction and in a cold operating temperature, actuate the pin puller with 125% explosive power. Thermal problems are prevalent with actuators and retention and release mechanisms. Uh, you have differences in coefficient of thermal expansion and they must be thoroughly explored to avoid jamming and excessive torque. Vibrations can cause unwanted deployment of components, and you want additional restraints, which are sometimes required. Micro switches on the Magellan were mounted such that they will detect the position of the solar panels as opposed to the status of the latching mechanism. And as a result, they were just a position indicator and not as a panel locked indicator. Care should be taken in deciding where to mount telemetry transducers uh, to assure that the desired function is actually being measured. The mechanical joint between the biaxial drive assembly and its mounting to the spacecraft allowed the transmit antenna to shift locations during launch. The four bolts did not maintain the proper preload and the joint slipped during launch loading, uh, which needs to ensure proper preload is maintained. All mechanical joints that require precise alignment should not be used, um, should not rely on friction to maintain alignments during any type of loading. All type of alignment joints should be matched, drilled with the body mount bolts or drilled and pinned after assembly. Anytime you rely on friction, there's a lot of variability in the behaviors of the mechan mechanical joints, especially for precise environments, may not be the best. And I'll bring this up later again. An actuator used to open and close the main sensor cover on the Clementine spacecraft experienced a heater failure during acceptance testing. There were two causes of the problem, excessive temperature and stress from driving the heater at high voltage. A mechanical stress on the heater from flowing maximum wax within the actuator during heating. The problem here was resolved by remounting the, layers, the heater and dropping voltage by incorporating a resistor in a series with a heater. Mechanisms that depend on frictional characteristics as discussed above here to restrain a load during launch vibration may slip and relieve the applied load. So we're looking at uh, mechanisms, anomalies, and lessons learned. The X-ray telescope uh, covers for the Alexis spacecraft failed to operate consistently during the thermal vacuum testing. And so on orbit, three of the six covers failed to open on the initial command. The lifting mechanism was not sufficient to completely break the O-ring seal. The spring energized Teflon seal 
were found to be a better solution. If you're going to use O-ring seals, you want, we, we want to ensure that, it completes, that, that the O-ring completely seals the area um, with a high actuation force, which is quite important. Otherwise, you're going to start having issues um, with the covers. Um, let me look at some examples here for bearings. Um, in a thin section, four-point contact ball bearings are increasingly employed in spacecraft mechanisms because of the potential advantages they offer. Lubrication problems and lessons learned with spacecraft deployable appendages include seizures of relative motion surfaces caused by excessive friction. So if you have a lot of friction, then movement may not occur and you may have stiction. Vibration induced fretting, uh, which can be a problem, um, which can cause excessive clearance in caging devices. Unlubricated surfaces exceed the bearing yield strength of substrate on hard coated materials, uh, lubrication or separation of all moving surfaces, either by suitable aerospace grease or dry lubricant coating should be used. Uh, no exceptions are allowed, uh, even for lightly loaded friction compatible surfaces. On hard mating surfaces where the hard coatings are used, such as a type 3 anodizing uh, on aluminum, the loads must be kept below the bearing yield strength of the substrate material. Smooth and polished surfaces are preferred. Uh, dissimilar materials mating surfaces should have no mutual solid solubility, or at least one of the two should have a heavy dissimilar coating. Caging devices should be designed to positively preclude relative motion between clamped surfaces when subjected to shipment or launch vibration. Weight lubrication is what we will prefer because then you don't have the friction issues, but then remember that there's moisture you can have frozen situations where now the bearings are not working properly. For extreme low temperatures and cryogenic applications, solid lubricants are really preferred. Um, and so you don't wanna, you wanna avoid the frozen, freezing idea. Lead coating has had success as a solid lubricant in vacuum applications. Vibration induced fretting and adhesion due to excessive clearances in caging devices uh, can be an issue. And I covered that one earlier, so I'm kind of repeating, but you also want to have a smooth and polished surface. That's preferred. And you also, if you have an unlubricated surface exceeding the bearing yield strength of substrate on hard coated materials, you want to really pay attention to that. Here are examples of problems that have been seen um, and what are the various issues in technology for shortfalls. Here in the first column, I show the mechanism type. In the second column, the mission requirement. In the third column, the technology shortfall. And the fourth column, the mechanical solution. In the first column, I have the solar array drive. And the mission requirements, reversible fast stow and deployment, 360 degree continuous rotation, and 10 to 15 year of life, high torque with very small ripple. The technology shortfall is reduced torque and torque noise, lightweight bearings and gears, and long life lubrication. Um, and the travel materials mechanical solution size so using solid lubricant and wear resistant films. We also have antennas and sensor platforms. We want to have a synchronous and sequential deployment, potential accuracy while retracting, and consistent friction over 10 to 15 years of life. What are the technology shortfalls is uh, lubricant life uh, and survival viability, low friction, friction noise, and jitter. Reliability under quick transition from stowed to deployed configuration. And so here you're looking at using synthetic hydrocarbons, so they'll produce low vapor pressure and additives, a solid lubricant film, so that has a low friction and wear, and new polymeric retainers for ball bearings. Release mechanisms, launch load protection, operational performance, and then for here what we're looking for is ship memory alloy and fatigue and reliability. So that's, that's a shortfall. And the mechanical solution is solid lubricated 
mechanical release mechanisms. So many of the problems you see in satellites are due to thermal or thermal gradient problems that reduce clearance or causes the lubricants to fail. Both titanium carbide and titanium nitrate have been demonstrated to be an effective wear coatings on the appropriate conditions. The titanium carbide has been applied to gyroscopic ball bearings and it's increased the operational life by quite a bit. So we have to, uh, again, uh, avoid the use of wet lubricants uh, where optical devices or sliding electrical contacts are used. Um, the friction torque of ball bearings on the thrust loads and low temperatures are really hard to predict. And so that's why you want to be really using, uh, you want to be doing testing at temperature to determine torque levels, and you want to make sure that there is no unexpected increases due to frictional torque values. We also have the situation that we need to discuss about linear rolling elements and cages can creep, which leads to a high torque spike at the end of travel. To prevent this, a cage speed control device is typically required to ensure the correct cage to the ball speed ratio. Considerable care needs to be used when you're mounting a close clearance bearing component into aluminum structures that must operate at cold temperatures. You want to account for the contraction of the aluminum. Single axis antenna de delayed deployment by near three hours when one of the com compartment attachment lugs came into contact with a compartment kickoff spring mechanism interference between a Attrition devices and attachment lugs should be avoided. One of the single axis antenna drive motors stalled because the service loop harness became pinched between the boom and the compartment. The motor was reversed to relieve the pinch and deployment proceeded normally. Reversible motors can help correct deployment problems. And on the second flight of the Intel Sat 5 spacecraft, the time required for successful deployment of the North Solar Array was longer than originally predicted. Significant increase in hinge friction at low temperatures and vacuum occurred. The hinge friction problem was overcome by increasing the bearing clearances to allow for greater temperature variations and giving the hinge special lubrication. We also have the example of the Galileo high and gain antenna, which opens like an umbrella and it never reaches a fully deployed condition. And here the contributing factors were the galling and excessive friction in the midpoint restraint pins and the V-groove socket of the struts, which required mechanical drive towards in excess of motor capacity to free the pins and permit deployment. Contact stress of any netting surfaces should not be great enough to cause plastic deformation. Uh, and or destroy applied coatings. Friction in vacuum can substantially exceed friction in the atmosphere, especially when coatings are destroyed and gadding occurs. The use of a dry lubricant, and if you use uh, specifically MOS2 on a me mechanism in atmosphere, you should evaluate it because the wear rate of this lubricant is much greater in vacuum. And so you have to do some analysis and testing to gain confidence. I want to also point out that shipping vibrations and ground testing can destroy coatings and dry lubricants. Vacuum deployment tests on the ground should consider uh, simulated vibrations prior to deployment. And during ground testing of the Dynamic Explorer, an end of travel shutoff switch failed to activate during the AstroMass deployment. So we had an issue there with the Microsoft uh, Swift and the failure in space could have been catastrophic and it points the necessity of having redundancies. Another example is the mechanism was to deploy Risto or this Risto two large Hubble Space tel Telescope deployable appendages in a varying but controlled manner. The predicted aperture door mechanism temperatures could be well below 125 and was a problem for the grease planning on the angular contact bearing due to solidification temperature of this lubricant being, being 120F negative. Uh, so the resulting stiffness of the lubricant caused an acceptably high bearing torque even through the mechanism when it will operate as low as 160, negative 160. The gamma ray observatory had two solar arrays wi uh, wings 
and weight approximately 500 pounds each. And one high gain antenna boom assembly weighed approximately 525. The high gain antenna did not deploy when it was initially commanded. And a portion of the antenna release mechanism was caught by a piece of a thermal insulation blanket. So very important there to make sure we have clearances. Deployment tests should be done with the final configuration, including the thermal blankets, because that's going to help you look for interferences. And spacecraft attachments should be simulated accurately. Mechanisms should be evaluated for vibration problems and appropriate damping be applied. Vibrations can cause unwanted deployment that must be constrained. After positioning G, the GOS in its final orbit, there's eight booms and five mechanic mechanisms that were deployed. Two of them showed anomalies during deployment, and one of these long axial booms extended only like partially. So to reduce the possibility of friction due to cold flow or disguided rings, the tightening torque was reduced and the Teflon guide modified in the ball release piston and ball cage area. So very important to consider that friction can play a role in and that you have to really pay attention to these mechanisms because they can get stuck. You know, you can have a lot of different issues with lubrication, friction, and so forth. During the Hubble Space Telescope antenna pointing system testing, the internal thermostat failed and it made the internal heaters inoperable. External heaters were bonded to the outside surface of the gimbal housing with external mounted thermostats, completely bypassing the external circuit. The problem with that is that uh, you could have an issue with that. Uh, where possible, then, it's very important to wire uh, internal heaters and thermostat completely accessible in case the internal components fail. Otherwise, you're going to have trouble accessing those components. During acceptance testing of space telescope antenna pointing system gimbals, the external cover of the heater dislodged during thermal cycling testing. So the cause was incompatibility of the coefficient of thermal expansion. So you want to pay attention to coefficient of thermal expansion. It's usually not paid attention to, but the CT mismatch between a metal and, say, a bond, that thermal expansion can cause a failure. And so, uh, you know, that, that caused an issue in this case because of CT. Heat cover should be mounted mechanically along with a, a epoxy bond. Uh, that, that's going to help a little bit with this CTE issue. If external heaters are to be used, an epoxy should be designed for use as a thermal conductor uh, so that CTE mismatch uh, is minimized. We also want to pay attention to issues with deploy more, deployment actuator mechanism, which was really, the, you know, one of them was developed for the Topex satellite, and post vibration testing showed that the dry lubricant film in the journal bearing was flaking, causing an increase in torque. The problem was determined to be excessive lubricant film thickness. Thermal vacuum testing of the Topex deployment actuator, viscous fluid rotary damper, revealed a region of undamped travel. Immediately after deployment had been initiated, followed by normal operation throughout the remainder of the travel, um, you know, it, it showed the value of the thermal vacuum testing. It showed that when you do that, it can reveal issues with the design. In the On April 11, 1991, um, there was an issue with a stalled motor about 50 seconds into the deployment. And that was considerably short of the full antenna deployment test. And the test revealed that the transportation environment caused spreading. So you need to pick, make sure that you're packing the shipment, the packaging for the shipment should not allow relative motion between components, that there's redundancy of the push-off springs um, so that the initial release of the spacecraft deployable appendages could occur. An anomaly occurred with a plunger-activated hermetically sealed switch during ground testing of the upper atmosphere research satellite. Gravity effects caused the plunger to deflect away from the switch, preventing motor cutoff at the desired position. The solution was to redesign the switch activation device so it was not gravity sensitive. Mechanisms must be designed for both ground test and space operation. The plunger designs of switches could pose problems on ground test due to gravity and a camp actuator actuation may be preferable.
General anomalies for deployment mechanisms typically include non-redundancy of the motion producing elements, insufficient torque margin, snagging, stiction, binding of panel hinges, and excessive impact loads from the deployment. There's also the issue of poor selection of solid lubricants, improper cone angle for cone supports, and excessive bending stiffness of wire harness at low temperatures. The lesson learned is uh, to maintain a torque ratio and a torque margin, and also you want to make sure that the panel hinges should have spherical bearings with axial clearance to avoid binding. Dampers are also necessary to reduce kine kinetic energy at impact. Sensors should be applied to deployment mechanisms and devices to determine initial motion and intermediate motion, that's important too, and a latch lock indication. For articulation motors, sh sensors should be applied for output shaft motion position and no reference speed and current. You also want to pay attention to the retainer instability, which is a major cause of bearing failure in control moment gyroscopes. There is a critical friction level associated with these retainer rings designs uh, that, that make, can make the retainer to go unstable. Modification of the bearing surfaces with inner coatings that result in decoupling of the lubricant from bearing surfaces usually offer the best course to ensure maximum lubricant life. Most mechanical problems with these momentum reaction wheels control moment gyroscopes, and gyroscopes are lubrication problems, and so you want to pay attention to those. Bearing lubrication depletion between a ball race retainer causes cage instability, and subsequent pointing errors increased bearing torque and wheel vibration. Here I have a table, and I welcome to pause the video and look at the first, second, and third, and fourth column, and look at the types of wheel types you could have, the problems you could have, and then the causes and the action. For example, a reaction wheel for, which usually have four per satellite, you may have an orbit, an orbit and test failures and high torque. So lubrication depletion is a cause, and the action is to use a, a better qualification of that new lubrication. Reaction wheel, and so you have here a list, and so, you know, lubrication, st starvation, degradation, lube loss, these are, they tend to be the primary issues. Guidelines for warm gear system, uh, you have the guideline here in the first column, and reason. And so, uh, what we want to make sure is that for gear systems, uh, you are optimizing the contact part to break in. You want to avoid high contact load on the outer edges of the gear, gear tooth, um, and you want to avoid undercutting. You also want to avoid geometric interference. Um, guideline for warm g gear systems. The guideline here is to use a slightly larger center distance for hobbing, and the reason is that you want to optimize contact prior to breaking. You also want to make the face width a maximum 50% of the warm diameter, and the reason for that is to avoid high contact load on the outer edges of the gear tape. We also want to avoid low pressure angles on low tooth count gears, and avoid undercut undercutting as a consequence. The total count should be a minimum of 40, and so the reason for that is to avoid geometric interference. We want to avoid speeds and stall, and so low speed promotes severe boundary lubrication. Grease uh, lubrication may require special techniques to maintain performance, and so the reason for that is that oil film benefits from replenishment, such as an oil bath. We want to use fine surf surface finish because it improves the lube and wear. And then we want to set up the gear setup so that the initial contact pattern is on the leaving side of the gear. And that, what that allows is it, it, it allows extended life. Break in gradually with loads and ab abundant lubrication is recommended and it, it increases life as well. Let's look at an example of the James Webb Telescope and the system overview. I welcome you to download this material from online sources. Here, my point of showing this, it shows a launch vehicle, the Orion 5 launch vehicle. It shows a satellite in there, uh, and you can see 
um, that's clocked at an angle, the launch vehicle, for that. And here is the, the launch environments and the deployment of it. And what I want to really point out is that there's a number of ground systems that have to work successfully uh, to ensure that everything is going on well from a system architecture perspective. Here, I want to cover uh, the offset of this uh, spacecraft. You can see there's an offset there. And the lateral offset of the center of gravity of the Stowe Observatory is shown on the right here. And it's not within the bounds of the Orion 5 user's manual, which you can find and download, and I've discussed some of that. So the Orion space program provided feedback on the allowable CG, um, with, which is willing to sign on, on to at this, this time. And so you're going to have issues. If your CG is off, you're going to have issues on the vehicle side that need to be addressed. And so systems engineering typically will get involved to figure out solutions to these issues. Here I'm showing the elements uh, and regions of uh, the James Webb Telescope. Uh, you have the instrument module, you have the electronic locations, the momentum, the sun shield, uh, the solar array, uh, spacecraft bus, and so forth. They had a number of concerns, and my point of this particular slide is not to show you um, the, the types of of concerns, but to point out that you need to rate the concerns for a spacecraft typically, and it's usually track as a watch list. You, you have the lower priority items that need to be addressed, but are lower priority. You have the medium priority items that need to be addressed, and then you have the higher priority items that without them, you're going to have a significant issue. And he, here's an example of thermal dissipation issues, cryo cooler pinch point margin, you have mass margin issues. The CG offset thing that we talked about, uh, that, that's, that's a big deal. Um, and then you have the actuator failure. Medium priority items could be like straight light levels. You could have launch shock issues, which can be resolved. You have stability issues and jitter effects. And the lower priority issues will be validation of the sun shield deployment or the car cycling of the Jim West telescope uh, and so forth. And so this will end the presentation, and I hope that you were able to take some time to reflect on the failure modes, lessons learned, and realize that mechanisms do play a big role when it comes to mechanisms, um, and that there are a number of failure modes. And you know, MMMO is one of the biggest ones. Uh, you don't want to have impact damage, lubrication, deployment issues, friction issues. Um, and actuator issues, pin failure issues, usually due to, due to some other friction conditions, and so forth. So I hope this makes sense, and I hope you have a good day.